Welcome to the first South East Regional Group's online meeting. Today's presentation uh, is being given by uh, Jonathan Turner from Radio Waste Management. And he's going to be talking about um, what is a geological disposal facility and what opportunities does it present for the geoscience community? Uh, so over to you, Jonathan. Thanks, Holly. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, in these most unusual circumstances, this is a, a first for me. I mean, I guess like most people, I've done family Zoom calls and sort of sociable Zoom calls. Very much appreciate you giving up your time to join us this afternoon. Um, as Holly says, uh, my plan this afternoon is to talk for 40 minutes. I've only got 12 slides. I think I want to show a quick uh, 3D model after the slides are finished. But in other words, to leave plenty of time for Q&A, our long experience of, of giving public talks to groups like the this regional group the geological societies that people have such a range of different questions some of them technical some of them inevitably geological but also communities policy health and safety um, the origin of the ways how has britain got to the to the point where it's at in terms of its uh, radioactive waste inventory so i do plan to leave plenty of time for the q a so great, so without further ado, I think I, I shall crack on. And, and before getting into the slides, uh, I thought I'd start with a safety moment and um, a, a topical one. Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, his wife works at Winchester Hospital and she had a story from last week whereby a lady had been admitted with really quite serious burns. And what had happened is this unfortunate lady had applied um, hand sanitizer rather liberally of course, hand sanitizer is up to 80% alcohol, probably not rubbed it in enough or rubbed it off enough before making contact. I think it was with a, a piezoelectric charger on a cooker hob and she basically, there was a static charge and um, she suffered major burns. So the safety moment uh, is just be mindful of the fact that when you're lathering your hands up with sanitizer, you know, it's, it's flammable stuff, inflammable stuff. and. Um, you know, rub it in before you go anywhere near a naked flame or uh, a potential uh, electric charge. So on to the theme of, of this afternoon's talk. And, uh, you know, this talk is, uh, so I work for Radioactive Waste Management. I'm chief geologist in the company. The company comprises about 200 people. And we've got a, a fairly small but perfectly formed community of geoscientists in the company. And I have a, a sort of oversight role um, uh, being and getting involved in all the geoscience work that we do within RWM. So the slide that you see here is of lots of happy uh, smiling faces and I start with that for good reason because even though you won't be surprised uh, to hear that delivering uh, a geological disposal facility is uh, a significant technical challenge, I think everyone involved in this project agrees that the greater challenge is what I'll call uh, the people challenge. Uh, so therefore, uh, appropriate to start with um, a variety of different people. Most of the photos you see here, the ones with the white captions, are stills taken from videos that, that we, that's RWM, produced a couple of years ago to complement a, a rather dry, fascinating, but dry document called the National Geological Screening that I'll talk a little bit about later. It's designed for public consumption. So we produced uh, a series of videos that explain some of the terminology, some of the geological concepts that are in there and so on. The photos I really want to focus on are the two in the bottom there with yellow captions. Maybe I'll start with the one on the left here and they tell an interesting story. So this gentleman uh, here is Klaus Tegerstrom, who was director of SKB. So that's the Swedish a counterpart of RWM, um, so they are responsible for delivering Sweden's geological disposal facility. And the two gentlemen, the two smiling gentlemen he's with are the mayors of uh, Oskarsham and Forsmark on the Baltic coast of Sweden. And you can see they're both happy and smiling. They had both competed for the rights to host the geological disposal facility um, in Sweden, uh, which ended up going to Forsmark. Uh, why they're both smiling. Well, the GDF itself went to Forschmark. As many of the surface facilities as possible uh, went to Oskarsham, some of the warehousing, the training, the canisterization, the laboratories and so forth. And I think it's a powerful picture because 
it sort of tells the story as to where Britain wants to get. So by we're presently at the stage of opening initial discussions with potentially interested parties, people and communities interested in finding out more about what's entailed in hosting a, a geological disposal facility. And this is the point that we want to get to really, whereby we've built trust with those communities and with those community leaders. They understand what a GDF is. Most importantly, they understand its implications for long-term investment in jobs and infrastructure. And a similar story in the photo in the right there, this is, this is taken from a visit that I made a couple of years ago now to the, the only operating facility. It's in New Mexico, it's in Southeast New Mexico. The gentleman here is the mayor of Carlsbad, which is the closest uh, town to where the facility is. This lady here is the high court judge, and this lady here is what's called the district uh, commissioner. All three of them stalwarts of the local community, born and bred in Carlsbad, despite the fact that they've got an oil boom in the Permian Basin on their doorstep, uh, staunch supporters of GDF, because unlike oil and gas, which waxes and wanes, as we certainly know right now, GDF is about long-term investment in jobs and infrastructure. So I just thought two really powerful images that emphasize how actually so much of this project is about people. Good. Um, what have I got down here? Well, I'm not going to read the text verbatim. It is uh, UK's largest environmental project. We are, we, when I say we, I mean radioactive waste management, we're part of the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority and therefore we often get branded part of the nuclear industry, but I argue actually we're part of the environment industry. We're delivering an environmental solution to what has been really a 70 year challenge for the UK in terms of what to do with its higher activity radioactive waste. And what to do with it, we in common with almost every other country that faces that challenge of how to dispose of its radioactive waste inventory have concluded that the best solution is a geological disposal facility, a GDF is the acronym, and that requires three key ingredients as you see there. It requires a willing community, it requires a, a suitable design, a suitable site rather, and when I say suitable, I mean it needs to be suitable in terms of accommodating the design and the engineering, but also the geology needs to be suitable in terms of um, ensuring the integrity of the facility over the hundreds of thousands of years post-closure period. And that's really what's encompassed uh, in that term that I use here, safety case. And then the third key ingredient that I won't be talking about much this afternoon is suitably packaged waste. And the three bywords, as I always think about it, that go with um, GDF is containment isolation or our containment isolation and passive safety. Containment, in other words, ensuring that radionuclides are contained deep in the subsurface such that they can't migrate into the shallow subsurface where they could harm people in the environment by getting into the food chain. Isolation, isolation from what? Well, so isolation from two things really. The first is isolation from surface processes. Of course in Britain we don't have volcanoes, we don't have rapid tectonic change, but what we do have over the hundreds to thousands of years post-closure safety period during which we would need to write safety cases, what we do have is extreme climate change and ice ages. So iso uh, isolation from surface processes, but also isolation from what we rather jargonistically call um, inadvertent human intrusion. In other words, future generations mining into the facility, either inadvertently or knowingly, but the reason for deep geological disposal is to protect the higher activity waste, to, to, to protect the, the radioactive material from inadvertent intrusion. And then the third of the bywords that I think goes with GDF is is what I summarize really as passive safety. So this is about engineering the facility such that effectively 160, 200 years from now, once it's reached the end of its operational period, it's been backfilled and sealed and decommissioned. Effectively, it's about walking away and throwing away the key. I dare say we will, well, there will be, I shouldn't say we, should I, because I'll be in my own personal GDF long before this project is complete, but I dare say there would be installed as part of the facility various uh, monitoring technology, but effectively it's about 
making such a good job of engineering it and understanding the geological environment that it looks after itself thereafter. And then the fourth point that I've made there is really just a nod to how one so often reads about this issue um, in the media, and that is that it's about a disposal and it's not a dump. We call it a geological disposal facility. Now, I understand why the media prefer to use dump, which is a single syllable compared to geological disposal facility, which is 12 syllables. And I think we've got to do better there. Maybe come up with a word like vault, something like that. That the point about dump, as I think everyone would agree, it sort of conjures up an image of having a, a tipper truck, a JCB, and just sort of randomly pushing this material into a sort of open pit. And of course, as everyone understands, it's a, it's a very long way from that. So it's about disposal, not storage. It's highly engineered rather than being um, a dump. Let me just get my pointer back. So where is the material stored at the moment? And when we show this map that you can see here, people are often surprised to find that actually they live fairly close to where there are nuclear facilities. Of course, the one that everyone knows about is Sellafield in Western Cumbria, where about 70% of the volume of UK's higher activity waste inventory is stored. But there are about 25 sites elsewhere around the country where material is stored. And a GDF is about taking the intermediate and the higher level waste, which I'll explain what that means in a minute, and disposing of it permanently deep underground. The sort of artist impression, the schematic, if you like, that you see down here in the bottom right, just gives a flavor of how a GDF might look. So you can see three vertical shafts extending from the surface. You can see a drift or a ramp that's capable of taking heavy plant from the surface down to the subsurface. And then you can see two separate layouts of vaults in which the radioactive waste would be stored. On the left here is where the heat generating waste is stored and it occupies a larger footprint because, because the heat generating waste is generating heat then it needs to be spaced more widely apart. On the right here is the greater volume of non-heat generating waste or sometimes called intermediate level waste that can be stored packed in a lot more tightly. So two halves to the geological disposal facility. Surface facilities up to about two square kilometers, subsurface facility or subsurface footprint up to about 20 square kilometers. So it's very clear that this diagram is not to scale. And just to add to that point, the depth at which the GDF will be constructed is between 200 and 1,000 meters. It certainly won't be shallower than 200 meters because it would interfere with potable groundwater and also because of the prospect of deep erosion during future glacial episodes. Why the 1,000 meter limit? Well, it's unlikely that it would need to go deeper than 1,000 meters. And as you can imagine, costs increase in a non-linear way the deeper that you go. When you look at other countries and the depths at which they're proposing to construct their facilities it's generally, in fact it's always between uh, 400 and 600 meters. So I mentioned the schematic in the bottom right here. It's clearly a highly sanitized landscape. It doesn't really look like anywhere in the UK. These, again, uh, schematics, cartoons, they're not of anywhere in particular in the UK, although one of my colleagues is always amused that this looks distinctively like St. Bee's Head in West Cumbria. That certainly uh, isn't intended, but you can see here, just giving you a feel for how the surface facilities, facilities might look and how they might be integrated with uh, port facilities and uh, sitting alongside a local town and uh, a local labor force. So let's just say a little bit about the nature of the inventory, and I won't dwell on this for, for too long. So I mentioned Sellafield earlier, and uh, I think we might have Lorraine on the line. Apologies, Lorraine, for showing a picture of Sellafield on a particularly foreboding looking day. If you've been to Sellafield, or indeed if you've ever been walking uh, on the Western Fells, you can see Sellafield uh, in the distance from there. 
at least one of these two plutonium stacks has now been uh, demolished and I believe the second one is on the way to being demolished. Someone might be able to correct me that actually that demolition has been completed. But Sellafield has been ex in existence since as a nuclear facility since the end of the Second World War. UK has been in the nuclear industry right since the advent, advent of this technology. And just about every different form of um, uh, technology for producing nuclear material, of course, particularly weapons grade uh, material, which is a lot of what Sellafield's early history about was about, but also different experiment, or experiments for different types of nuclear reactor are at Sellafield. And again, to make the point that I made earlier, GDF is really about decommissioning Sellafield and putting the waste that's stored there underground out of harm's way, disposing of it permanently. Just say a little bit about the, the nature of the waste and uh, the graph in the bottom right there or the bar chart in the bottom right there actually makes a, a, a simple point for me and that is the sort of inverse relationship between volume and activity. So I've divided the inventory into intermediate level waste, i.e. non-heat generating lower levels of radioactivity and high level waste conversely heat generating and higher levels of radioactivity. So in terms of activity levels, the uh, high level waste absolutely dominates the inventory. So about 70% of the activity in the total inventory coming from uh, nuclear new build spent fuel. However, it's the intermediate level waste that dominates the inventory in terms of volume. So this this um, sort of inverse relationship between activity uh, versus volume, which is really important to appreciate. Again, keeping on the theme of intermediate level waste and high level waste, two different uh, disposal solutions. I should emphasize that it will be more than two, but two categories of disposal solution. Um, I mentioned that Britain, like France and like the US has been uh, in, involved in the nuclear industry really since the advent of this technology and because of all the experimental facilities at Sellafield it does mean that we've got, we the UK has got a more complex inventory than any other country in the world. We've got in, in excess of 120 different waste streams and if you compare that with for example Sweden and Finland who are often cited as being having made really good progress with their GDF which is absolutely true but one of the points that I would make there is that their inventory is far simpler. They've basically got about two waste streams comprising spent fuel from their current fleet uh, of reactors. So I'll start with the disposal solution for high level waste. And I should emphasize there's a really important point to make here. And that is that until we have engaged with a community, until we start carrying out site investigations and understanding the geology and the geochemistry and the groundwater then we need to keep our options open in terms of the disposal solutions because what we talk about in RWM is what's called the multi-barrier concept in other words the way in which the engineered human made human manufactured barrier interacts with the geology and I just want you to bear that in mind throughout this talk and I'll return to it a couple of times in some of the later slides, but a concept that is really forms our planning assumption in terms of designing our WM's program at the moment is that the high level waste would be uh, contained in hermetically sealed five centimeter thick, um, about five meter long uh, copper canisters. This is the KBS system if you're familiar with the um, design concepts that Sweden is employing. So hermetically sealed five centimeter thick copper canisters, which are themselves then emplaced in sort of donuts or rings of bentonite. The idea being that when the facility is abandoned, decommissioned and resaturates, the bentonite swells and seals the high level waste in this um, sort of tomb of bentonite. And then outside that is the rock itself. Intermediate level waste, very different disposal solution, which I'll look at in a little bit more detail little bit later in the talk. But in this case, the intermediate waste is contained 
in unsealed, and I'll explain why that is later, unsealed uh, stainless steel uh, 500 litre drums, which themselves are encased in um, a very specialized hyperalkaline, high porosity um, backfill material, sort of cementitious backfill. And then out with that, outside that is the geology depicted by this, this pale gray shade. Okay, well, I'll just let this slide fill up. There's lots of information on here, and I'm just going to make a few, hopefully, quite simple points from here. So, so this slide is, is really trying to make two points. One is the multi-barrier system, how the engineered barrier works together with the geology. The second is the, is the time dimension, and the, the slide really runs, what did you see there, time frames, one, two, three, four, five. The slide really want, runs from left to right. So on the, to start with, the Intermediate level waste in this case, so these are meant to depict 500 litre stainless steel drums. The intermediate level waste is emplaced in vaults uh, in the geological disposal facility. And really from the outset, it starts uh, generating gas. Why is that? Well, it's because that the, there's organic material included within the waste. Uh, there's also um, you know, processes like radiolysis and hydrolysis. And for that reason, I mentioned a few moments ago that the intermediate level waste canisters are not sealed. For that reason, uh, they're not, unlike the high level waste canisters, these canisters are not hermetically sealed. And therefore, as we run through these time frames, so over the hundreds of years period during which the uh, vaults begin to resaturate, um, and these stainless steel drums corrode, and that corrosion process in itself generates more gas. So over the hundreds of years period, uh, we have gas generation, and then moving on to the thousands of years period, the radionuclides, some radionuclides will escape from the drums, and that's where this hyperalkaline cementitious buffer comes into its own, because why is it hyperalkaline? Because, well, alkaline conditions um, reduce the mobility of radionuclides, and the high porosity of this cement buffer uh, promotes retardation. It promotes adsorption of the radionuclides such that they don't escape into the geological environment. Then over the tens of thousands of years period, this is where the, we need to bring into play the role of the geological barrier. And in particular, we will need to demonstrate to regulators, particularly the Environment Agency, that groundwater is sufficiently isolated from the surface such that there are no fast pathways from depth to the surface where, for example, it could enter the food chain or where human activity could intersect plumes of groundwater containing radionuclides. And then over the hundreds of thousands of years up to million year period, this is where processes like extreme climate change and ice ages are taken into account. And we use a sort of probabilistic modeling approach there to understand the impact that in particular ice ages would have uh, on the geological disposal facility. Natural examples in terms of communicating with uh, the general public and uh, uh, sort of large variety of external stakeholders that have an interest in GDF. Natural examples and natural analogues are really important. I've just put a selection of three up here, and the one that you you might have heard about, which I think is really powerful natural analogue, is it's called Cigar Lake. It's the world's largest uh, or most important high-grade uranium ore mine in the world. It's in Saskatchewan uh, in Canada. It's 20% grade uranium ore. And as you can see in the caption there, uh, there are no radionuclides both in the overburden or detected at the surface. The uranium ore itself is encased in a very fine grain, low permeability, organic rich mudstone, which has acted a bit like a, a natural GDF. Jumping to the right hand side here, this is uh, as you see, it's about a 400-year-old uh, bronze cannon barrel. Uh, it's in one of the laboratories at SKB and Sweden. And the far end of the cannon barrel was sticking in anaerobic sludgy mud, low oxygen, therefore low corrosion. Whereas the near end of the barrel, you can see, was sticking out into relatively oxygenated seawater, far more 
rapid corrosion, far um, uh, less well-preserved ornamentation in the cannon barrel. And again, mimicking some of the processes that will be important to GDF. So early saturation of the facility, the oxygen will be consumed by microbes and thereafter the low oxygen conditions actually promote low rates of corrosion in the GDF. And the last natural analogue I just want to mention, it's a rather obscure one, it's a place called Makarin in Jordan and it's essentially a, a, a natural equivalent of that hyperalkaline buffer um, that, I, that I mentioned earlier. So the rock here has been naturally affected by a hyperalkaline volcanic plume, which has meant that solutes in the groundwater have interacted with the rock. And what you can see is a network of cracks and fractures in the rock here. In other words, the alkalinity of the rock has led to minerals being precipitated in the cracks and fractures that have sealed up the rock in much the same way as would happen in the buffer that I described as entombing the intermediate level waste that I spoke about a little bit earlier. Okay, so now I want to get on just to, I think most of the remainder of my talk is, is really focusing on what I mentioned earlier as the national geological screening, which many of you may well have seen. It's on the RWM website and it's a series, it's a suite of of documents and cross sections and maps and tables which are designed to describe the geology of England, Wales, Northern Ireland as it relates to safety for a GDF. I should mention at this point, I'm just going to keep an eye on the time, I should mention at this point I quite often loosely refer to England, Wales, Northern Ireland uh, in terms of uh, the UK but I should emphasize that radioactive waste disposal is a devolved process and Scotland has opted for um, a different solution, which is called uh, near surface, near source. So RWM is managing uh, radioactive waste disposal on behalf of England, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland. So the National Geological Screening, it was the uh, initial action that RWM needed to deliver before the siting process was initiated at the end of 2018 and it describes the geology of England, Wales, Northern Ireland under five headings. I'm just going to briefly go through those five headings and the first of them unsurprisingly is rock type and despite the, the rich diversity of both ages of geology and, and, and uh, lithologies, rock types that we find in our relatively postage stamp sized piece of crust that is the UK. So despite the huge variety of different rock types, in terms of their potential for hosting or, or constructing a GDF in the rocks, we recognize three broad categories of potential host rock. And these categories uh, are classified on the basis of the different ways in which groundwater moves through them. So the first is is salt. Salt is pretty much salt, you know, there's not much lithological variation in terms of salt. In particular, I'm talking about halite. We've of course got two main uh, halite bearing successions in the UK, the Permian and the Triassic. The photo that you've seen here is from Bulby Mine, uh, as much as 1400 meters deep, uh, south of Teesside in the northeast of England. Uh, an example of a GDF which is constructed in salt is the WIP facility in New Mexico that I mentioned earlier in this talk. And the point about salt is that it's pretty much dry. It pretty much contains no groundwater uh, and cracks and fractures within it uh, would self seal because of the well-known plasticity of salt and its tendency to creep under the sorts of pressures that you find in the crust. Second category is what we rather jargonistically called low strength sedimentary. By that, I mean claystones and mudstones. In other words, fine grained, normally dark gray, I guess the exception to that being the Mercia mudstone, but fine grained claystones and mudstones, very low permeability, groundwater moves only very slowly through them and cracks and, cracks and fractures would tend to self seal uh, and heal uh, thereby reducing the potential for groundwater to flow within these rocks. And then the third category, so maybe there would be a dozen low strength sedimentary rock horizons that you could think of uh, in the southern half of the UK. The Mercia mudstone, the Toarshian, the Lias, the Oxford clay, 
Kimmeridge Clay, the Galt. And then the third category, which is a real sort of potpourri of maybe a hundred or more different rock types, what we call high strength rocks. In other words, these are often, but not always crystalline rocks. And the important point about them is that uh, groundwater flows advectively through these rocks through networks of fractures. So they might comprise granites or meta sediments or slates, or even highly compacted carboniferous or older sediments. So that's rock type. And these are the three sort of broad categories of potential host rock type we recognize. Second category under which the geology is described uh, in the NGS is structure. And as it says there, structurally uncomplicated is better. And I'm not meaning to focus on the Mendips, but the map here just shows an example, I could have shown lots, an example of a relatively structurally complex piece of terrain. So it's the Mendips, it's just east of the M5, uh, south of Bristol. What have we got here? We've got highly fractured carboniferous limestones. Clearly they're folded. There's a big thrust that cuts out the syncline between anticline here and anticline to the south. I went to Bristol University. I was a keen caver in those days. The limestones here are full of caves and they're not far to the northeast. We've got 45 degrees centigrade spring water bubbling out at uh, the Roman baths. Uh, evidence, um, you know, diagnostic evidence of a fast pathway from depth to the surface. So a relatively structurally complex area, <coughs> excuse me, area. The point I would make is that do remember that the footprint for a GDF is likely to be less than 20 square kilometers. So we can actually fit it into a fairly small area. So structurally uncomplicated, better. However, we're not needing actually to find a huge piece of real estate. Okay, the third category within the, under which the geology is described in the National Geological Screening is what we call natural processes. I think it's what many people on this call were probably, uh, if you did a geology degree or an environmental science degree, it's what you would probably call natural hazards for obvious reasons, wanting to avoid the word hazards. But in a UK context here, what we're talking about is two main processes. There are, <clears throat> I need some water. There are others, but two main processes. One is ice ages and the second is earthquakes. So the map on the left, the details don't really matter, but this is a map uh, that resulted from some modeling work carried out by the BGS that models likely thickness of permafrost for the UK. And if you can see the legend on the left there, as much as uh, in excess of 500 meters of permafrost could be expected in um, a, a continental glaciation episode in the future. Why is that important? Well, permafrost is one of the phenomena associated with ice ages that has a, a profound influence on how groundwater behaves and the hydrogeology of the deep crust. So that's important that we understand the potential impact of these natural processes on the post-closure um, safety case for the GDF. And then secondly, the second the natural processes that I emphasized is earthquakes. Obviously, UK fairly low levels of activity, certainly compared to places like Greece or Turkey or parts of the US. Nonetheless, many of us will have experienced earthquakes. All of us will have heard of earthquakes when they happen occasionally on the news. Biggest earthquake just about within living memory was the 1931 in excess of magnitude six event that happened in the Southern North Sea on the Dogger Bank. The point I would make is that you know, we need to be mindful that despite the fact that the UK is relatively quiescent, uh, fracking induced tremors, particularly with the operations that have been going on in the last five years uh, in, La in Lancashire have really intensified public interest in earthquakes. Fourth and penultimate category within the national geological screening is groundwater. And the, the bottom line there is a simple one that's summarized in the caption. We need to cite the GDF either where deep groundwater is absent, for example, I mentioned salt earlier, or in the case of those high strength rocks where groundwater can move relatively rapidly, advectively through fracture systems, we would need to cite a GDF 
where we could demonstrate that deep groundwater systems uh, are isolated from shallow groundwater systems with very long return times to surface. And among the evidence that we might use to particularly to publicly communicate that second point about isolation and long return times is using stable isotopes to quantify the time during which groundwater has been stagnant in the subsurface. And here you see from the East Midlands, from the Sherwood Sandstone Aquifer, at only 400 meters depth, uh, groundwater has been stagnating there for something like 100,000 years. Really powerful piece of evidence. If you're trying to demonstrate to stakeholders and the general public, this point about long return times to surface. And then the final category under which um, the geology is described in the NGS is, is resources. And the point here being that um, places that have in the past been intensively exploited for resources um, create complications in terms of, uh, well, particularly they complicate the hydrogeological system. So I'm talking to you from Birmingham, about 20 kilometers West of here, we've got the black country, you know, the nucleus of the industrial revolution, literally hundreds of shafts and artisanal uh, underground workings, many of which aren't known about until they collapse and cause shallow earthquakes. These are places where that we tend to downgrade in terms of their attractiveness for um, constructing uh, a GDF. Uh, so the illustrations really speak for themselves. The map in the top right there is just taken directly off the BGS website. Hopefully you can see the Wirral Peninsula and the Trisic, uh, so the geological map in the background. But what you see is the way in, you know, the sort of pincushion effect, the way in which the UK in common with many other developed countries is peppered by mostly uh, shallow boreholes. And then on the left there is a map outlining the uh, potential gas shales and oil shales that are known about for Britain. So the, the, the Carboniferous gas shale that was, um, well, that's been tested with the, uh, with the fracking operations in Lancashire that I mentioned a few moments ago, shown in blue, the Jurassic Wealdon, or the Kimmeridge Clay mainly, uh, gas shales and oil shales in the southeast of England and then the Lyosic rocks a little bit west of there uh, in the Wessex Basin. So the last point I want to make before I wind up and we hopefully take some questions and have a discussion is one of the questions that we're often asked is, uh, are other countries doing this? And as I think most people know, yes, uh, most, most other countries that are facing the challenge as to what to do with their or how to dispose of their uh, radioactive waste inventory are ahead of Britain in terms of their plans to develop a GDF. So there's an operating facility in the US. Uh, as you see in the top left there, the Swiss are focusing on a Colovian Oxfordian, sort of super fine grained, almost ceramic grain sized um, claystone called the Opaliniston, which they have. So they're focusing on three areas. They've got three. Uh, 3D seismic data, uh, 3D seismic data sets in the northern Alpine four deep, and they just started uh, at the toward the end of last year, drilling the first of a suite of boreholes in those three areas. And if you recognise the rig there, it's the Marriott rig that was involved in some of the Carboniferous gas shale operations uh, in northwest England, and seismic operations shown here in the photo in the top right. Let's move on to. So the solution, the disposal concept that the Swedes are working with, and another example there would be the French, is uh, in this case, Middle Jurassic claystones. Similarly, Colovian Oxfordian claystone that the French proposed to construct their facility in on the eastern, sort of southeastern, no, eastern edge of the Paris Basin uh, at a place called Bure. And the, uh, so the photo in the bottom right there is, as you see, a picture of a tunnel. It's lined with these prefabricated um, uh, sort of concrete panels. And uh, yeah, it's really quite a nice picture. Very clean, very efficient, very sort of clinical look to it. 
And then I've talked about Sweden and Finland earlier. Uh, as you can imagine, except for the southern half of Sweden, uh, both those countries are dominated by mainly Archean, granitic, crystalline rocks. So they are proposing to construct their facilities in uh, granitic, high strength rocks. Uh, the Finns have decided um, on the location for their facility at a place called, called Oltiloto Island uh, in the western part of Finland, about three hours drive from Helsinki. The photo I showed right at the start of this talk, the mayors of Oskarsham and Forsmark, Sweden is developing its facility at the place called Forsmark. The picture here is from, not from Forsmark, but from an underground rock laboratory that the Swedes have developed at uh, Esper, which is actually nearer to Oskarsham, which are the two communities that bidded to have the facility. That's the, that's the community which, which uh, ended up not having it. So lots of activities uh, in other countries. It obviously, uh, we benefit hugely from collaborating with them closely, understanding what worked for them, what didn't work for them, and also using their experience to comment on our program and the progress that we're making. So all I would finish with is uh, uh, thank you for bearing with me. Welcome any questions. And lastly, I would point you to uh, RWM's website where there's lots of uh, good material on there. And I think a lot of the audience that are on this call here will be particularly interested in the National Geological Screen if you haven't seen it already. So many thanks. Over to you, Holly. Wow, thank you so much, Jonathan. That was great. Um, this is where we give you a round of applause. Um, so I'm giving you a virtual one. <laughs> um, if anybody has any questions, if you just um, raise your hand in the participant section or pop it in the chat box um, and we can go through. Oh, there we go. Uh, David Reed, over to you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Yes, I just looked at the, um, the cartoon on the intermediate level waste disposal. And you're probably familiar with the last public inquiry where the concept of chemical containment was said to be unproven. Um, since then, a lot of research has been carried out and it, if it proves anything, it's that it's not a reliable concept. Have you had any more thoughts about that? Um, I, I must admit, I'm not overly familiar with the particular inquiry that you're referring to. The, uh, the, uh, the, um, the rock characterization facility one itself. Is. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Yeah, from the, yeah, so uh, for, for the benefit of everyone else, so the last time, and what I didn't really go into because I didn't want to sort of go beyond my hour, but uh, Britain has had a long history of um, attempting to uh, find a suitable site uh, in which to construct its GDF. And I think many people will be familiar with the name NIREX, who attempted to get a license to construct what was then called a rock characterization facility, a bit like that underground rock laboratory that I showed from Sweden in the last slide. It was to be just a few kilometers from Sellafield and to cut a, a very long story very short. That process was cancelled for mainly political reasons in 1997. So the inquiry that David is referring to is around that work that went on in the mid-1990s. I mean, hopefully I can answer your question directly, David. Uh, the challenge with intermediate level waste is that it's a bit of a paradox, really, because people rightly think of the high level heat generating waste as being the most dangerous stuff, which it absolutely is in terms of ionizing radiation. However, the difference is that you can hermetically seal the high level waste such that the integrity of those five centimeter thick copper canisters, if that's what we um, eventually opt to use, they have a, a lifetime of 100,000 years or more. The challenge with intermediate level waste and chemical containment, which is what your question is about, is that you can't hermetically seal the material because it generates gas, you know, for, uh, due to a whole range uh, of processes. And therefore, you need to design an engineered barrier which allows for the fact that radionuclides will um, escape, I suppose is as good a word as any, radionuclides will migrate out into the near field environment. So hence the 
sort of critical importance of that uh, alkaline, highly porous, cementitious buffer, you know, can't be overemphasized. It's a part, it's a part really of the packaging concept. So whilst I'm not, I must admit, I'm not fully familiar with the inquiry that you're referring to that dealt with the details of chemical containment, I can't see how there could be an, inter an alternative for intermediate level waste. In other words, you have to engineer the barrier system such that you allow for radionuclides to escape, get out into the near field environment. The key thing is to uh, design that buffer material such that radionuclides don't escape into the natural environment, into the geology. So it sort of half answers your question. I suspect you're much more familiar with the mid 1990s inquiry than me, but you know, do ask another question on the basis of how I responded there, please. No, I, I think you gave a very good response. It, it is a conundrum, but mm. it sort of flies in the face of the um, of the containment or isolation uh, concept, and and that's where I think the the public inquiry failed because people understood things like, but the concrete will crack, whereas they didn't understand um, the more nuanced um, argument that you just used about uh, allowing it to disperse within um, a very permeable backfill. That, that's just, a hard thing to get across. It, I, I completely agree. It's very hard to get across. And uh, as I say, it's a bit of a paradox that the most dangerous material is actually, uh, there's a much easier or much straightforward, much more um, robust disposal solution for high level waste compared to the intermediate level waste. And, and I, think, I think one of the keys is, you know, I mean, everyone that works for a company, you know, will, will know their company values and company values vary from the really good to rather dry. But I tell you in RWM, uh, you know, we have to live and breathe our company values. They're about safety, they're about accessibility and openness and trust. And I. I think really the only, the only solution to the conundrum in your question is to be very open with people that this is the nature of intermediate level waste and that it isn't sealed in five centimeter thick copper canisters and that this multi-barrier system that I've repeated, you know, talked about so many times is, is, a, is a fundamental part of the disposal solution. So there's, you know, we've got so used in the modern media environment to sort of, 10 second sound bites and you know radioactive waste disposal is not a 10 second sound bite and and that's why you know in opening up initial discussions with communities as we're doing now you know it's a long process it's about building trust and it's about taking them through some of these really difficult concepts but i suppose that the, the last point i'll make before i wrap it on for too long is just bear in mind that we're one of the most scrutinized, uh, highly, regulated, highly regulated industries, not just in the UK, but by comparison to nuclear industries overseas, actually in the world. And you know, we, the, the Environment Agency and subsequently the Office for Nuclear Regulation will, you know, will pass or not pass our disposal solution, depending on how, rob how robust they judge it to be. But I take the point of your question, even though I'm not familiar with the inquiry, I apologize. Okay, we've got um, two questions in the chat box. The first one's from Sophia uh, Shafi cook uh, With the high level waste, what sort of temperatures are likely to be generated and are they likely to cause problems for surrounding strata? Um, about 200 degrees centigrade at the interface between the bentonite. You remember I said that those canisters will be emplaced in, I think I called them donuts or rings of bentonite, which then swell and seal in the canisters uh, once the facility resaturates. So about 180 to 200 degrees centigrade. Now, the effect of that temperature increase on the wider geological environment, so at, to cut a long story short, about a 40 degrees centigrade increase in ambient temperature in, uh, in, in the overburden. Obviously it decreases with distance from the facility, but you know, 
uh, 100 meters, 200 meters from the GDF in the overburden, you would expect a, a, a 30 to 40 degree centigrade increase. So quite a significant increase in ambient temperature, which naturally decays, you know, reduces, declines quite rapidly with time because the rate at which the uh, temperature efflux uh, declines from the heat generating waste is, is relatively rapid. Uh, you know, it actually declines really quite rapidly over the hundreds of years period. So the second part of the question was, what effect does that have on the strata? And uh, it's a really good question. Uh, and it's something that we are doing a lot of experiments on uh, right now, particularly in collaboration with the Swiss uh, delivery body who are called NAGRA. So they have uh, an underground rock laboratory in the Jura in which we're carrying out experiments uh, which we're effectively um, simulating that 200 degree centigrade increase and seeing the effect that it has on the bentonite buffer surrounding the canisters. The other thing to mention is in terms of effect on the sedimentary strata, what I'm particularly interested in is if you had very stiff, e.g. highly crystalline granitic uh, host rocks in which you'd constructed the facility, then a temperature increase like that is going to lead to an increase in the near field stress field. And that increase is actually quite significant. It's about 15 megapascals uh, in the sort of near field environment. I can't remember how many hundreds of meters that is extending away from the GDF, but quite a significant increase in stress uh, around the GDF. And that stress, we therefore need to understand the implications of a stress increase like that for, uh, in particular, for reactivating small fractures and causing tremors. So there's all sorts of uh, you know, processes that are tied up with the increase in temperature that the question refers to. Fab, um, the next Does that answer the question? I mean, I don't know I think if, if someone responds to a question, I'd be really interested what their response is or if they've got any further questions, but. Um, so no, thank you. No, thank you, that was great, thanks. Okay, the next one's from um, Sam Lanks. Um, how do we stop future societies stumbling across the GDFs and unearthing their contents out of curiosity, ignorance? Yeah, interesting. There's um, one of the things that I have been contacted on quite often, and some of my colleagues the same, is um, there's a whole community of, of uh, often academics out there who are really fascinated by what is in the jargon what's called semiotics which actually means how do you mark the site and some of you may have heard of um, uh, a feature length film it's on youtube it's called into eternity that was commissioned by the finnish delivery body called possever it's really worth it's very good you wouldn't have thought that sitting down in front of the tv with a glass of wine and watching a 90 minute film on radioactive waste disposal would be your idea of a, of a great night in, but it's a really very good sort of stylish uh, Nordic piece of film noir. But what that film focuses on is exactly the theme of the question that you've asked here. And that is how do you mark the site and how do you ensure that future generations, and bear in mind that when we're talking about up to a million years post-closure safety case, it's not just future generations, it's future civilizations. How do you stop them uh, by curiosity, by accident, by mischief, uh, mining into the facility? There's several points I'd make. I mean, the, the, the first one, these points are in no order. The first one is let's not assume that future people will be any less intelligent than us. I mean, given what we can detect remotely in the deep subsurface with geophysics, they, in inverted commas, they may well know exactly what is down there and they may well understand exactly what they're mining into. So that sort of deals with um, generations that would be doing it deliberately, maybe to exploit the radioactive material or some of the materials that were disposed of underground. In terms of people doing it mischief, mischievously or accidentally, that's exactly 
the reason for that's that's why we emphasize deep geological disposal i.e. hundreds of meters up to a kilometer underground because that minimizes the chance that people will just sort of inadvertently accidentally unwittingly stumble upon it how do we mark the site there's some fantastic stuff on the internet about it and it's something i don't know very much about you know there's the idea of having sort of huge chunks of pink concrete the french have thought about a special um, species of flora and, and plants and trees I actually think that's a strong argument for not marking the site at all you know you know if you go and stay in a house maybe you went on holiday with your parents and there's a room at the top of the house that says keep out it's the one room that you want to go into so there's all sorts of different views on it and it's something that we we RWM are not focusing on much at the moment because you know we've got a program to deliver but maybe 20, 30 years from now, I think how to mark the site will be a real, really rich area of, uh, of research. Okay, we've got lots of um, thank yous and great presentations as well. Um, so just on behalf of um, the South East Regional Group, thank you again, Jonathan, and the virtual clap. It's a pleasure. So, or could you just say the name of that Nordic film again, please? It's called Into Eternity, it's on YouTube. Fab. It's really very good, it's very stylish. They basically, Posova, who's the, that's the delivery body in Finland, uh, carefully selected a film producer. It was a he. When they selected him, uh, he was given free range to go where he liked, underground and overground, talk to who he liked. Possibly had no editing rights on the film and he, he's produced something really very good. It's worth watching. Into Eternity. Excellent, add that to my list. <laughs> Fab, well, thank you everybody and hopefully see you all soon. Stay safe.